hypocrisy doesn't work. We are entering into an epistemological crisis. Okay. Now, I'm going to unpack um, those lines uh, a little bit as, as we go along. Um, so let me, let me just start with the, um, the idea of an epistemological crisis. If you were a philosophy major in college, you might have heard the word epistemology. Outside of that realm, this is a word that appears very rarely, even in crossword uh, puzzles, right? So, so let's look at the word epistemology. The word epistemology means the study or the science of knowledge. And the discipline of epistemology is supposed to answer a couple of questions for us. What is it that we know? As different from what is it that we believe? Or what is it that we hope? Or what is it that we would like to be true? What is it that we know? Not what is it we wish, okay? Not what is it we opine? Not what is it we find uh, in the op-ed page of the paper? What is it that we know, okay? And then how do we know it? It turns out that there are a lot of people who believe that they know things and indeed that they believe these things with deep convictions. But the second question is not so much what we know, but how is it that we know these things? My father told me so. Okay, that's one way of knowing things when you're three, okay? Um, so what is it that we know and how do we know it? What's the difference between knowing, opinion, and conjecture? What's a legitimate source of knowledge? I had a very uncomfortable experience as a parent about 20 years ago when my daughter, who was about 12 years age at the time, was sitting at the dinner table and I offered an opinion on a subject that had appeared in the Spokesman Review that morning. And she looked at me as if I was a complete and total idiot and said to me, that's not what Roxanne says. Roxanne, it turned out, was her 12-year-old friend. And if you know anything about adolescent psychology, you know that for adolescents, the peer group is God. And the adult parent is an idiot who must follow you when walking into the supermarket at a safe distance so that nobody thinks you are with them, all right? So I was indignant at being demoted to such a level below Roxanne. And I said in a futile gesture, does Roxanne have a doctorate? It turns out that for 12 year olds, doctorates are relatively unimportant for ascertaining the authority of a figure, all right? It turns out that what's important is that this other person is my close friend, all right? So epistemology is the study of knowledge. What is it that we know? How do we know it? What's the difference between knowledge, opinion, and conjecture? What's a legitimate source of knowledge and what's not? And can we trust our senses, our reasoning, our memory, each other? The essential question for our conversation this morning is, what authorities can we trust us, can we trust to correctly inform us about different issues? Now, before the modern age, mostly people relied on kings and religious authority to tell them the truth. The Pope, the Bible, the bishop, the pastor told us what the truth was and we followed or believed. The king, the emperor, the Caesar told us what the truth was, and we as the king, emperor, Caesar's loyal subjects believed. Truth was mainly a matter of belief from authority, all right? In the modern era, and particularly in the era of democracy, we made a shift, and that is, it, in, in, with the rise of modern democracy, we no longer had the king or the pope to tell us what the truth was. And in the public square of democracy, when we had to resolve difficulties and develop policies and make decisions, we had to agree with each other on what the truth was. And we didn't get the truth handed down to us by people on high. We developed two parts of a method. One part was we decided that we would give a large number of people a voice in deciding what the truth was. In a democracy, we ascribe to some version of what we would call the popular vote. And the majority now had the power which the king or the pope had previously had. 
But we soon discovered that the majority could often be wrong, just as wrong as the king or the pope had been in the past. And 10,000 Frenchmen weren't necessarily right when making a decision. So we put a check and a balance on this popular uh, consensus. And we said, we are also going to pay attention to evidence, reason, and expertise. And this led to the growth of a group of professions or disciplines that had particular responsibility for telling us things and to whom we deferred about areas that were more complicated. Or as you might think, this led to the rise of the weatherman. So if you wanted to know what the weather was, you tuned in at around 6.15 on a regular evening and some gentleman or lady would tell us what the weather was going to be. And we assigned them the job of spending their day finding out in various methods what the weather would be. Sometimes it was because they felt a swelling in their wrist or sometimes it was because they put a divining rod over water or sometimes later they used scientific methods and they discovered or predicted what the weather would be. Or sometimes they just lived in Arizona and they knew it was always going to be sunny and it was never going to rain, okay? So what happened then is that we had this conversation that we developed in democratic societies, which on the one hand paid attention to a consensus of a popular vote and gave a lot of voices to a lot of people who had not previously had voices, as the pastor said this morning, to the people we had not paid attention to, right? And so there was a kind of democratization of truth. But we also realized that there were a number of people because they had read or studied or developed professional standards or expertise, had particular insights or genius or brilliance about particular areas. And so we deferred to the weather person for the weather. And we deferred um, to academics for certain areas and for, to scientists and to medicine for other areas and to political scientists for other areas. And so we had this kind of, let's say, cult of the elite experts. And this conversation began, all right? And the result of this was that we had what Obama describes as a kind of marketplace of ideas. And the notion of a marketplace means that it's a free and open space where there's rather regular competition and where ideas are weighed by their merit or by their value to the larger group. And the goal in this marketplace is to persuade a large community to develop a shared consensus or a vision, right? And this is a decidedly less violent approach than the approach of the, of the king or the pope who command by authority and who punish people who do not consent to what the king or the pope says in these matters, right? So this new approach, now, the approach was, I think all of us know, deeply flawed. And that is that in the history of the United States and in modern democracies, sometimes the elites gained an upper hand and paid no attention to the popular voice. And sometimes they gained a certain kind of arrogance. I would offer as an example, Robert McNamara. Robert McNamara was uh, the Secretary of Defense under John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Baines Johnson, and he was known to be a brilliant man. And he told us a story about Vietnam that turned out not to be true at all. But we deferred to him because he was, in fact, so much smarter than the rest of us. And then only later did we discover that being that smart did not mean that he was being that truthful. We also have comparable stories um, from the right where conservative politicians did similar things. And we also know that people in great power and with great wealth often do not tell the truth about complicated issues to the working or to the poor classes in society. But we also know on the other hand that when the populist tradition gained an upper hand in this conversation or this marketplace of ideas, that the populist trend often tended to oversimplify issues, sometimes to be nativist or to be nationalist, sometimes to scapegoat outsiders, and were tempted towards a kind of fascism. 
And we saw this in Germany in the 1930s, and we saw it in Italy, and we saw it in Spain in around the same period, and we saw temptations towards it in the United States in the 1930s. And so we know that in democracies, there can be a tendency towards a kind of authoritarian populism or towards a kind of arrogant elitism, and that these two need to be held in check and in balance to have a genuine marketplace of ideas. So democracy is a relatively delicate creature that has to be fed and watered constantly, and it has to be nurtured in a way so that people can be certain that they actually are getting the truth in the marketplace of ideas. All right, so that raises a question. The question is, what is it that we need in a democracy in order to function uh, in terms of knowledge? So to make good decisions and to function in a democracy, we need four things. First of all, we need reliable access to factual information about a lot of things. Now, in the 19th century, a reader of the American press would not have had access to this first thing. That is that in general, yellow journalism that dominated the press in the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century was generally sensential, why can I not say this word? Okay. It was Citizen Kane journalism, all right? And, and that is, they tended to tell stories that were outlandish and outrageous in order to sell more copies. The very notion of presenting a reliable objective story in our newspapers appears only really in the first third of the 20th century and then gets enriched after that. Okay, so the idea that you could pick up a newspaper and get an objective narration of the facts of cases outside of your town that would tell you about the complexity of the reality of your country and indeed of the world is only a notion that arrives in the United States in the first third of the 20th century. So reliable access to factual information has only come to most Americans in the 20th century. Secondly, we need authoritative sources of this information that we can trust. And this too is a relatively recent development. Until the beginning of the 20th century, most of the medicines that you would buy in a, from a pharmacist in the United States or in Europe were either useless or dangerous, okay? Most of the medicines that you could buy in a pharmacy in the United States or Europe were either useless or dangerous. And in fact, some studies show that the wealthier you were in Europe and the United States in the 18th and 19th century, the more likely you were to be exposed to the disadvantages of medicine and the shorter your lifespan was going to be. So it is only in the 20th century that modern medicines are being delivered to people that are certifiably safe and useful. So it's not just journalism that has improved significantly in the 20th century, it's also medicine and it's also science, right? Um, and it's also the university and academies. And that is what we can see is that there's an increasing trend towards professionalism and objectivity and, and better fact gathering in these gatekeepers of information in our society. So now, in the 20th century, for the first time, people also had authoritative sources of information that we could trust. Now, it's not, this doesn't mean that people didn't think they had authoritative sources before, right? A lot of people living in the ancient world or in the Middle Ages absolutely believed in the authoritative sources of information that they lived off of. And it makes sense because you're going to grab onto any rope that's handed to you in a storm, right? So, of course, people believe that the, that the king and the pontiffs were always and everywhere telling them the truth. And that was a part of the belief of being a subject or a believer. But what we know in the present age is that we actually have reliable, checkable, certifiable sources of information in a number of areas that we didn't have before. But along with sources of information, we deeply need a shared consensus about the underlying facts of our common lives. If you have ever been to a family reunion, had a conversation with siblings about events that happened in your childhood and you discover that your, your siblings, your sisters and brothers are in fact either amnesiacs or heretics 
And that is that they are living with completely different narratives of the childhood, which you experienced and which you know to be certifiably true because your memory tells you that that's the case. Then you know that it's very difficult to construct an opinion about that childhood with people who don't agree with the basic facts of the case. No, you had three brothers, not two, okay? Oh my God, that's a big one. So the same thing is true in a democracy. In the marketplace of ideas, it's absolutely essential that we be able to agree on some things. Now, I'm a Catholic, you're a Methodist. I'm a Republican, you're a Democrat. I'm an independent, you're a socialist. I'm a Texan, you're a Californian. We have differences. I'm Irish, you're Italian, all right? We, we have differences, but we have to agree on the basic things. If we're going to play football on a Sunday afternoon or play soccer, we have to agree that football is played with a certain kind of ball and is played on a field that is a certain length and a certain size, and that if our players run over this certain line, they score this many points. We have to agree to those kinds of things. And we have to agree that when the referees or the gatekeepers of the game say that his team scored a touchdown, then he gets the six points to go up on the scoreboard and my team doesn't. Now, without that consensus, democracy doesn't happen. So we don't just need the facts and we don't just need the, the uh, authoritative sources of the facts, we need consensus which is a form of nonviolent peacemaking. I agree to abide by the rules of this sport while we are playing this game. I am a Muslim and I will worship on a different day than you. I will eat a different food than you. I am a Catholic and I believe different things than you about this. I am a Republican and I adopt a different fiscal policy than you do. But when we're playing football on this field, I agree that a yard is a yard, okay? And a score is a score. Without that consensus, all we have is tyranny or anarchy, but we do not have democracy, which means that we have to agree to consent to the rules of democracy. And one of those rules is the rule of the marketplace, which is that we consent to be open to the evidence, the facts, and the reason, and to be persuaded by those that are presented to us in clear and certifiable ways about everything from COVID to climate change to election results. We agree that when we see the evidence and it's certifiable, we will consent to both the evidence and to the actions that must follow from that, according to the rules of the game, we have agreed to play. Finally, we all need confidence that we and others, those outside of our tribe, our faith, our club, our community, will be open to and will act on reliable, confirmable evidence. That is, when the coach screams at the ref that any blind man could have seen that my player did not foul that other player and that that player took a nosedive onto the court to entertain the audience, all right? That coach must be willing to accept the ruling of the ref and when the coach sees it on the visual replay and sees the bruise spreading across the other player's face from the knuckle, that went into that player from his player, that coach has to consent to it. And if the coach doesn't consent to it, he may be a hero to his team and to his fans behind him, but he is violating the game and we will not be able to play with him in the future. Now, that's why epistemology is important which I wish they told me in college when I was a philosophy major because it was the most boring course I ever took in my life. And if I had known it had any actual application, I would have paid more attention and not have to go back this year and read that book again, all right? So, so that's what I'm talking about. We are having an epistemological crisis, why? Okay, could do that, next one. We're having an epistemological crisis because a couple of things are going on. First, we have a problem with false beliefs. At the present time, tens of millions of Americans believe certifiably false, sometimes outlandish things, okay? Pizzagate, 
The story widely published that Hillary Clinton and others were organizing a pedophilia ring in Washington DC in the basement of a pizza restaurant, okay? This was reported to have been believed by 40% of the voters for the last president of the United States, okay? That's roughly 23 million people, okay? I, I think we can say that this is an absurd thing, all right? So we're not even talking about disagreements about climate change or about COVID or about vaccinations. What I'm suggesting is that tens of millions of Americans either believe or claim to believe. And this is an important distinction because I believe that it means I intend to play as if it's true, even though I don't actually believe it, which is a kind of malice that is deeply problematic in a society, right? while rejecting confirmable knowledge readily available to them. That is things that they could have seen on the television or the things they could have read in the paper or things that are confirmed by public health officials, okay? So let me give you two examples of the latter. The widespread resistance to the statements of public health officials in the last year that has led either to the removal of some of those officials or to the public harassment of those officials because people do not want to believe what these health officials are telling them. So the assertion that I can choose not to believe this particular page of science while subscribing to all of the other pages of science which tell me how to start my automobile, how to turn on my gas oven, um, uh, how to get heart surgery, um, which medicine to take for a headache, but I selectively choose um, to reject this and to harass this community. And that this is not a phenomenon we're seeing in an isolated or extremist group of Americans. This is a phenomenon we're seeing in what may represent about one third of the US adult population, okay? So basically one third of the American population has basically decided on some level that they're not going, they're, they're going to believe what they want to believe and disbelieve what they don't want to believe, right? And that that's going to have significant impacts on our ability to construct a democratic conversation in the society. Now, these false beliefs are deeply assisted by the fact that there is a flood of bad information, misinformation in our social media and news ecosystems. That is that we have misinformation, which is sometimes just mistaken information. And we saw a lot of this in the early months of COVID. Right? This was a novel virus. That means we had not seen it before. Any of you who have ever been parents of teenagers, you had just mastered being able to be parents of preteens, and then suddenly an infection of hormones raged through your household. And so you made mistakes because this was the first time you'd ever been parents of teenagers. And by the time you had finally mastered this, they were adults, all right? And now, of course, you could have been somebody with a family that had 25 children, and you might have been smarter on the second 12 than you were on the first 12, okay? It's possible. But for most of us, this is an experience where the learning curve was very steep, all right? And where the opportunity for uh, mastering it came once or twice, but not more often than that. It was a novel experience, not necessarily meaning an entertaining or an enjoyable one, but it was new and we were learning, we were learning to drive while trying to put our pants on at the same time, right? So guess what? The CDC made mistakes. Scientists made mistakes. Researchers made mistakes. Pharmacists made mistakes. Politicians made mistakes. Lots of people made mistakes. And lots of them were just honest because it was the first time in the room with the germ, right? So we get a lot of mistakes um, from our traditional gatekeepers of all of this information. And sometimes it's because the information's quite complicated. Sometimes it's because the journalist gives you 15 seconds to explain international trade to an audience. And so of course you take the most simplistic narrative possible. As an aside, I actually had about four hours of material for this morning and I'm trying to reduce it to 55 minutes. So I've cut out a lot of stuff which may not be interesting but which would be much more complicated and would drive you to deadly boredom, all right? 
But in the, the presenter always has to do that. Try to figure out to tell the, both the simplest and most interesting and most complex narrative at the same time. So mistakes are made all the time. In journalism, mistakes are made all the time because it's the first page of history, it's the first draft of history, so they're not getting it right. So there's a great deal of misinformation. Only very small children and very arrogant teenagers are justifiably enraged at the fact that they don't get the truth all the time. This is a thing which children and teenagers say back to us, well, you said on Tuesday that this was true. Yeah, you know, the world is just more complicated than that, all right? It's just messier and more complicated, so grow up and get used to it, right? But, so mistakes get made for those reasons as well. But along with these mistakes, there's also been a significant amount of disinformation coming to us in the news media and particularly in the social media. And that disinformation has been assisted by a number of agents with malicious intent or with selfish intent. And that is that they have either been seeking to entertain us in such a way that we would stay hooked into programs that we found particularly disturbing or enjoyable or disgusting. And so, yes, we drive slower when we go by a, a train wreck or a car wreck than we're doing on the highway normal. And that's built into our system. So the uh, people have known for generations that if it bleeds, it leads, that if you tell stories that are very fascinating and that make people feel angry at their enemies, they are more likely to spend time on your network and you get better advertising dollars. They also know that you can distract people with these kinds of stories or entertainment. So there's a good deal, not just of misinformation, but of disinformation and a good deal of propaganda. Usually we, pro we call propaganda commercials. And that is we know that as soon as we begin to watch a commercial, the goal here is not to give us the best information necessary in order to make the most intelligent decision. The goal is to motivate us by any means legal to get us to buy that car. That's the goal. So we have to become intelligent consumers of information so that we know that the car salesman is not telling us the same truth that the journalist on the evening news is supposed to be telling us. So false beliefs then shakes hands with a lot of bad information. The most dangerous thing about this bad information, however, is not just that we can be mistaken or misled about something, but that we, it can undermine our confidence in the basic ability that we have to discover the truth, right? Yes, I know that the car dealer at a certain place is going to sell his or her product with more zeal and tell me things about other products that are not necessarily true, but I have other resources. I have car facts. I can go to other dealerships. I can look in the blue book. I can investigate other ways to find out what the real value, price, or worth of this car is. But if I go to the news, and if I go to the social media and I'm told, and I'm given such a rainbow of information and so much of it is misleading, I am drawn both by my temptation to stick with my own beliefs or my own confirmation bias and ignore any evidence that goes against it because I can always find something that supports my position or I am led to a kind of moral relativism or despair and throw my hands up and say, there's no information out there. Yes, Trump lied, but so did Obama. Now, the fact that Trump lied 30,000 times and that Obama might have lied a couple hundred times, that should, be, that should be a slight difference. And that is, we wouldn't buy a car that broke down 30,000 times if we could buy a car that only broke down 100 times, right? We wouldn't make that choice. But the difficulty of being in front of a torrent of this kind of information is that we can either choose our private prejudice or we can throw up our hands and say, there's no point in having a debate or a conversation because we'll never be able to get to the truth. Now that is ultimately going to undermine democracy. If we go into a meeting believing that there'll be no way to persuade other people or even to discover the truth ourselves, then the marketplace of ideas, as Obama says, doesn't work and democracy in its essence doesn't work. We also have biased sources, all right? So one of the narratives that we hear over and over again is that 
um, we, have to be, we have to be fair and balanced, right? One of the narratives we hear is that in order to find the truth, we need to look between the two positions, right? This is a classically American narrative. Okay. I am about to say, as they say in Porgy and Bess, it ain't necessarily so. In the earliest stages of the investigation about climate change, when many things, many things were not known, it would be reasonable not just to listen to the climate scientists who were expressing growing concern about the threat being posed by the burning of fossil fuels. It would also be reasonable to pay attention to those scientists and politicians who had critical questions about this and who and worried about rushing in to radical changes in our economy and our politics on the basis of a couple of early reports. Last August, when the United Nations released its sixth intergovernmental panel climate change study that involved scientists from 160 nations and over 30,000 studies, the authors of that document said, we are now absolutely certain that climate change is actually happening everywhere as a result of the human burning of fossil fuels. Now to get 190 leading scientists to say things like absolutely certain means the party is over, the conversation is done. And anybody at this point who thinks that we need to listen to both of these voices to figure out where the middle truth is, is not paying attention, All right? What is also, so there are a number of issues that have been effectively resolved through scientific and medical research. The evidence on masks, the evidence on vaccines grows steadily. It also gets more complicated steadily, right? And that is, you can't say anything absolutely, but you can say that some things are more and more clear, and this becomes more and more prudent, and this is more and more reasonable. And the arguments on this side are weaker and smaller. Much like the arguments in defense of smoking, those people could occasionally find a study that would show that among 12 people in Southern Texas, there was an incident where smokers actually performed better on one test than non-smokers. Nobody would reasonably conclude from this at the present time that smoking was a better health pattern than non-smoking. So fair and balanced works when you're in a very early state of a conversation and where there's a real information shortage and where reasonable and certifiable expertise has not weighed in overwhelmingly on one side or the other. I think we're all pretty clear now. Feeding children doesn't work. We may have believed it for millennia that sparing the rod would spoil the child, but nobody who's reasonable believes this anymore. So this fiction about fair and balanced has to be contextualized and we have to recognize that. The other piece we have to recognize here is not only does not everybody tell the truth, but not everybody tries to tell the truth. And in our current news media ecosystem, that is in the spectrum of news media outlets that are available to us in the United States, there are significant studies that show that on the center right, on the center, on the center left, and on the left, most of these media news outlets subscribe, most of the major ones, subscribe to professional standards of journalism. So whether you read the Wall Street Journal, center right, the New York Times, center left, or watch MSNBC, left, center left, okay? Whether you watch any of these, all of these major agencies rely on the same objective standards and regularly correct errors that they make 
in their publications and pay attention to what the other sources of information are saying about these matters, all right? But if you look at the right wing of American news media, I'm going to name names here, if you look at Fox News, you will see consistently two things. That their commitment to objective professional journalism and to telling the truth about stories is significantly lower than the commitment of center right, center, center left, and left journals. Okay. The other thing you will notice about them is that the consumers of their information pay less attention to other sources of information than the consumers of any of these other sectors. That is, people reading the Wall Street Journal are also people who read other journals and other magazines, including those that are more conservative than the Wall Street Journal and those that are less conservative. Consumers of the New York Times, as a general rule, have a broader readership. That is, that they read journals or magazines that are to the left of the New York Times and to the right of the New York Times. But when we get to the right wing, we see not only a lower standard of factual objectivity, we see that the consumers of this news are more siloed and less in conversation with the consumers of other news in our society. Now this is, I'm going to argue, this is dangerous for two reasons. The first reason that it's dangerous is that when people look at the spectrum of news that's available to them, not the spectrum of opinions, I'm not just talking about reading the op-ed page, right? I'm talking about reading the news. When people see the spectrum of news that's available to them and they don't notice that one whole wing of that spectrum is consistently providing them with less reliable information and reporting narratives that nobody else will report because they have been fact-checked and then filtered out, then the people who consume that news are getting a dangerous set of narratives that are not putting them in conversation with other people. Let me make a parallel example. I'm a Roman Catholic. You're Methodist, okay? Today, we're much more ecumenical with each other than we were 50 years ago. I grew up in the southeastern part of the United States and I lived in towns where there was one, one Catholic church and there were often five or six Methodist churches or seven or eight Southern Baptist churches. And we often treated each other like aliens. We overlapped on the playing field of sports and in the public schools. And we had friends who were Catholic or Methodist or Presbyterian or Jewish, right? Honestly, in the Southeast in the 1950s and 60s, I did not have any Muslim friends, right? But, but we did overlap in that way. But inside of our tribes and silos, our religious communities, we did not converse or discuss about things that separated us, okay? Transubstantiation, the Virgin Mary, sacraments, those kinds of things. We didn't have those kinds of conversations. Occasionally, a Methodist boy or a Presbyterian girl or a Baptist child would say to me, why don't you Catholics share communion? And the answer to that was either, I have no stinking idea, or it was something completely Latin that I have no stinking idea, right? And then suddenly in the 1960s, Christianity goes through this ecumenical stage. And now we're all chatting with each other and we're all talking and we find that we don't disagree on so many things as we thought we disagreed on. We agree on many more things than we thought we agreed on. And we're willing to negotiate on a number of other things. But the important thing is we started talking to each other. But if a large segment of our democratic society is getting its news and information from, and I'm gonna use this word intentionally, from a religious site, and by religious, I mean one that does not have to pay attention to the rules of objectivity, but can take things on faith. If they're subscribing to that site and then they're not in conversation, then those of us who are not in that community begin to look like heretics, apostates, and infidels to them. 
and they look like idiots to us. And we find ourselves in conversations where I cannot believe they believe this, or I cannot understand how they believe this. This epistemological crisis is creating a divide or a gap, and it's being deeply assisted both by our tendency to accept things uncritically and by the tendency in, our, in, in the information sources to pollute the environment with misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, and baloney. And baloney is a word I'm using in replacement for another word that begins with B that is used in actual scientific journals to describe this, and that is noise that is shared as information with the express intent of lowering the credibility of all other information. So if we're sitting at a concert and we're listening to Chopin and some clown comes in with a big radio and starts playing annoying and loud music, we can't listen to Chopin. If the information market is flooded with disinformation, misinformation, and baloney, it lowers our capacity to listen to the truth or to find the truth or to believe that there's a findable truth or to engage in a real conversation with other people who disagree with us about these matters. And that is a threat that goes to the very heart of democracy. Now, okay, let's see, where are we? Okay, yeah, all right. So I'm gonna, we're gonna skip because I want to explain why I think this has happened. How about that? So can you go to this? Can you find that one? It's about eight or nine slides down. By the way, it, 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 you, can, you can share this PowerPoint with anybody and anybody wants it can have it. So all right, what, one slide up. No, one slide down, down. Yeah, there we are. OK. Now. I'm gonna suggest this morning that there are four basic sources to our current problem, all right? Um, some of those sources are inside of us. Some of them are in our technology. Some of them are in our information sources and some of them are in our political structure, okay? First, cognitive bias. Repeated studies indicate that consuming information that supports beliefs which we already have gives us a brain rush and is as pleasant as eating sugar, chocolate, or heroin, all right? Studies show that if you read an article that confirms what you believe about gun control or abortion or voters' rights, you will be able to remember 70% of the information of that article. You will enjoy the reading of that article, okay? and you will finish the article. The same studies show that if you read an article written by somebody who expressly disagrees with your position on a strongly held belief, it will be very difficult. That is, you will experience cognitive pain trying to finish the article, and you will often not do it. If you do finish the article, you will experience a good deal of anger and frustration, and, if you're tested about the article later, you will remember at most 30% of what you read. So we don't need to build walls around countries to protect us. We have walls in our brains. Right? Our brains seek out information that confirms what we want to be true. That's the first thing we have to know about ourselves. We are not objective consumers of information in a democratic society. We are consumers with an agenda and a bias. And we must be very careful about that bias because it is a dog that will lead us to places we do not want to go. Um, the, the second result is that we not only end up consuming only the information that we like, the ice cream that, we, that pleases us, but we seek out companions and colleagues and associations who agree with us. How many times in the last 18 months when you met somebody new or different, did you behave very carefully 
for a time until you discovered what their position was on masks or vaccines or COVID or the election. And then suddenly, if you knew they were on your team on one of those, what happened in your heart and the tension in your neck, right? And that is we actively seek out people who will serve as echo chambers and corroborators for us and confirm what we believe. And we avoid conversations with those who would disagree with us on these matters, okay? We self-segregate. Honestly, the line between Washington State and Idaho was one of those self-segregating lines. We see that all the time. You cross the border and you're in no mask land, you come over here and you're in mask country, right? So we know that this is true. So this is one of the sources of the problem, it's in us. Another source of the problem is that there have been significant technological developments in the social media, which feed on our cognitive bias. Facebook has algorithms which attract us to news stories, which confirm previous news stories that we have read. On top of that, social media uses two very strong emotions, fear and disgust to hold our attention in the same way that a car wreck does that to slow us down on the highway. In order to keep us there, they replicate the strategies of the 11 o'clock news, which for decades, would have a car accident or a bloody scene to show us at the beginning of the story to hold us to the 11 o'clock news. Even though that incident did not occur in Spokane, but occurred in Salina, Kansas, where we don't know anybody and are not related to anybody and would have no natural interest in that, but that's the closest car crash they could find at 11 p.m., right? Facebook and others use the same strategies to hold our attention, right? Um, others, um, for, so, for example, the original meaning of fake news came from a group of Macedonian students who had discovered that when they created fake news stories and put them on Facebook, that people would pay more attention to them, particularly if they were salacious and if they, if they evoked powerful negative emotions. And those Macedonian students had no interest in uh, persuading us to adopt a different political stance. They only wanted us to stay on Facebook an extra five seconds so that they could make more money in advertising. So, so the second thread that's coming at us is not just our own, it's that the technology has figured out how to feed on our own bias. The third issue, one we, don't, we, we need to pay much more attention to than we've been paying to uh, in relationship to the epistemological crisis or the epistemic crisis, is a growing economic inequality. This is, this is the oldest story of the last half century of American economics. It is the story all of us know in our hearts and our bones, that America has been growing progressively less equal economically for the last half century. That since the 1970s, the real wages of blue collar workers have not significantly improved while the cost of housing and other costs has grown greatly, and that the real wealth of the top 20, the top 10, and the top 1% of Americans has increased geometrically, okay? This is the curve. What that means is that we have increasingly in the last 50 years moved to a nation that is decidedly more separate and unequal, and that this gap between the working and the poor class between the manufacturing class and the service industry class and the donor class, right? That this, that this gap between them is growing as big as the, as, the, as the Grand Canyon. And that that is going to have significant political impacts. It is already having those impacts. And that one of those impacts is that these people are living in a separate world from these people and cannot talk to and do not believe what these people are saying. And that this is happening at the very time when the guardians or the gatekeepers of this, uh, of our information society are increasingly coming from the college and post-college and doctorally educated class who are in this group of people, means that this group of people don't wanna hear from them and don't wanna talk to them. So there are a lot of other reasons why we can talk about this, about the populism and the nativism in the conservative uh, working and, peasant and, and uh, 
poor class in America, and we can talk about things like ra racism and nationalism, and they are major factors, but we also have to acknowledge that um, this gap, this economic divide is deeply contributing to our epistemological crisis because there is no real conversation going on between these people. Finally, as I suggest, the asymmetry of our news media system presents Americans with a sector of the news system that they cannot trust, but that many believe in. And it is undermining the ability of one sector of our society to talk to the other sector. And it is undermining our basic ability to believe that we will be able to create a consensus of a public space of a marketplace of ideas where we will be able to have testable ideas that we can have a conversation. And more and more what we're getting as a result is people who don't believe or who believe what they want and who will not consent to agree to play by the rules of the game because they do not feel that they need to participate. I think of these people honestly as epistemological or epistemic rebels. And that is they're making a semi-conscious choice not to play anymore, right? And this is deeply dangerous for us. There are many people supporting this decision, politicians and news people are supporting these decisions because of their own self-interest in this process. But unless we can figure out how to create a genuine conversation across the boards, we are engaged as many have suggested in a non-military non but actual civil war. And that is, we have a growing gap and a growing divide. All right. Okay, so those are the reasons. And now, I told you I had four hours. Um, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna offer some solutions. So we just scroll down, give me, uh, down to some solutions. So keep, 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 keep. Please all just unpack what I just said. Yep, there we are. Okay, so that's way too small to read, so let me just give it to you. Okay, so what can we do? What are our options, okay? First of all, I think all of us have to start with a place where we recognize our own cognitive bias. I do, not enter, I do not enter this conversation as an objective person without an agenda. I have an agenda, okay? And that means it will be more difficult uh, for me and less likely for me to be able to understand persuasive, informative, and objective information from the other side. So. If I think of myself as a progressive, it's more difficult for me to read the Wall Street Journal. If I think of myself as a conservative, it's more difficult for me to read the New York Times. But if I, if I recognize that difficulty, then I have to address it. I have to actually start to seek out and consume not information that inflames or enrages me, but information that challenges me. Information that can be offered to me that will expand my sympathetic horizon and it will make me take seriously the arguments and the substance of other people who are intelligent, who have something to offer and who correct my perspective, okay? Secondly, I need to engage in more serious conversations with others, not just those we agree with. I'm not talking about screaming at people who disagree with us on masking. I'm not talking about publicly shaming or trying to do that with somebody who disagrees with us on vaccining. But I am saying, that there have to be conversations. There have to be conversations. One of the reasons why we have made as little progress as we have made on climate change in the last 50 years is that a lot of us who believed that climate change was happening felt it was too sad or depressing or difficult to talk about it with other people. When we have actual conversations, we can build consensus and we can make things happen, all right? But if we stay in our silos and if we don't talk about the things that are difficult or disturbing, then we know that's not true. We're all in families. We all know about avoiding conflict. And we all know how completely useless that is as a strategy, right? Well, the same thing is true of the democratic family. Avoiding conflict, right? I'm not saying going out and starting a war. Starting a fist fight at the dinner table is not engaging in conflict, all right? It's just another way of avoiding it, right? But engaging in actual conflict means be sitting in serious conversation and being vulnerable and being willing to listen to the other person and then being willing to check the evidence and being willing to do the work. That takes so much more work in the brain and it take, puts so much more stress on the heart, but it is the only path we have out of this conflict. 
Third, we need to become more politically active and engaged in our local community and in state and national politics. We need to stop thinking that somebody else is going to solve this epistemic problem for us because that is not going to happen. Um, we have to become involved. Now, I'm not saying that everybody in the room needs to run for public office, but we have to gather information and we have to be participatory agents in our society. Right? Next, we have to reduce, here's the thing. You go to the supermarket, you're supposed to shop around the edges. Everybody knows that, right? That's where the fruits and the vegetables are. You stay out of the processed and the fatty foods in the center of the store, okay? Because that's the food that's the less healthy. So you wanna eat food that's got more fiber and that's fresher. So here's the advice about consuming information. Stay away from the internet, okay? It's like the center of the grocery store. It's loaded with entertainment, rage and terror, okay? And those are three products that you need, like you need, I don't know, a loaded cheeseburger. Okay, there's, there's no future in that for us over the long term. So stay away from the internet, stay away from social media. Try to consume as much serious journalism as possible. Read your local paper, subscribe to a state or a national paper, read an actual journal, read a serious article, right? become an intelligent consumer of information, right? Um, so try to stay away from junk news the same way you would stay away from junk food, right? Try to eat higher on the news chain and try to stay away from the fatty and salty stuff, okay? Um, second, um, next, support expanded voting rights and support institutions associated with the academy, the sciences, and consume information from traditional gatekeepers. The threat to democracy does not come primarily from an external invading nation. Russian hackers do not pose the threat to our democratic society that is being posed by misinformation that is coming from in our society itself. The threat of deception, the threat of lies, the threat of information can be uh, resisted if we actively support, if we actively support our institutions. If we actively support the academies, if we actively support science, if we actively support our government institutions, if we engage and support our courts, if we engage in processes that will create a defense against the undermining of democratic structures. And then finally, and consistently, we have to address the economic divide. The increasing economic inequality is like a rising tide that is eating away at the foundations of our nation. And unless we address this issue, then our other strategies will not work. Now we, and I'm gonna suggest next week, we have extraordinarily good reasons as Christian believers to come to the aid of the poor and to overcome economic injustices in society. The Bible is shot through with arguments why we should be doing that. But we don't have to be religious to believe that. Jefferson himself argued again and again that the foundations of the democratic society could only be supported if there was a wide dispersal of economic opportunity in that society. And the more economic inequality, the greater the gap between the rich and the poor in our society, the less possible it will be for us to engage in public conversations and the less possibility that people will have who are, feel like outcasts in our society to participate in these conversations or to believe any information being disseminated by an elite caste that is living in a separate world from them. Oh yeah, it's, it's eight minutes over, but oh, that wasn't, you know, it's not, that's tolerable, you know, it's like, you know, if, if you were undergraduate students, you would have folded your notebooks and left by now, but you're very polite Methodists and you didn't do that. So thank you very much. So I'd be happy to answer any questions, or respond to any comments. And I'm also happy to repeat the injunction that Moses gave to the Pharaoh, let my people go. So anybody, stand, stretch, do whatever you like. Thank you very much for having me here this morning. Pat. People can run. Peggy. Pat, thank you for a wonderful presentation. It was uh, wonderfully researched. Thank you. Uh, as a polite Methodist, I do want to 
disagree with one thing you said about going to the internet for your news. Yeah. There are really good sources available. If you look for the BBC, Reuters, the Associated Press, you will get the kind of uh, sane, objective information you need. You're absolutely right. There is extraordinarily good information available to the to the to the um, clever hunter on the internet, to the seeker. That's you're absolutely right. And and particularly, you know, that locally we only have available to us the Spokesman Review and copies of the Times or something like that. So the internet can provide us with with resources. My concern is that in general it's being used in another way. That would be my only concern. Yes. Um, in my family. I find that to be true. Lately, I've been watching MSNBC. My sister is cooked on Fox News. And she and I hardly ever agree um, on just about everything, including her governor, she's from Florida, and my governor. It's, they, we hardly ever agree. And it just, it's the hell out of me. <laughs> That's it's it's, it's very it's very troubling, and it's and it's very troubling across families. It is. It's a very deep. I think it's, I think that Thanksgiving and the Christmas holidays and and weddings and other kinds of things are becoming problematic for people in ways that they had not been in the past. Right. I'm just curious, uh, Pat, since you uh, are a professor and you're dealing with these bright students. Um, how do you feel about their level of concern about what we've just talked about? Yeah, um, I don't experience my undergraduates as having the kind of um, political insight or activist tendencies that might have been present in a previous generation. What I worry about with my undergraduates is that um, they've been schooled from very early on to be good at school. And so they're very focused on their cumulative index and their grades and uh, they want to succeed very much. And I understand that they're under a lot more stress than I was under as an undergraduate. They have a huge financial debt that I wasn't facing. Um, they have a much more competitive uh, economic market. Um, so they're, they're experiencing fear and anxiety in a deeper way. In general, I think their, their sympathies are more progressive than mine were. I think that they're more open to other people, to outsiders, to immigrants, uh, to people of, um, of differing um, genders and sexual orientations. So they're more open to those kinds of things, but um, they're, they're less activist and less, um, yeah, I think, I think that's right. That's what I would say. Well, you get the award for staying the longest. You were the most tenacious. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>